Psalm 100, the verse 3. Psalm 100, the verse number 3. He said that knowing this, God is God. And God, God, He made us. God, God, He made us. We didn't make Him. We are His people. His will. Tend us sheep. Hallelujah. He will tend the sheep. Hallelujah. We are His people. It says, Know this. God is God. And God, God, He made us. We didn't make Him. We are His people. Yeah, yeah, onyame ma. Onyami, onyami. You. Onyami, onyami. God is God. God. God, He made us. We are His people. We did not make Him. Hallelujah. And as a human being that God has created, one of the things that you need to do always is to learn how to give Him glory. To learn how to give Him praise. To learn how to adore Him. To learn how to magnify Him. This morning, wherever you are, just lift up your voice and magnify the Lord in the house. Just magnify the Lord. Lift your voice and magnify the Lord. Wherever you are, Danyamiasi. Fasside menyame. Isanso nunkuto no saye yi. God is God. And God, God, He made us. We didn't make Him. We are His people. We are tended sheep. My God, my God. Somebody lift your voice. Me Machi kwa pa, machi kwa pa, mi di wa ye, wa ye iri bra o, eje machi kwa pa, oh machi kwa, mi si mi di wa ye. Rebreo, Martin Quapa, Martin Quapa, it's a Martin Quap. Yet can say, Yeah, the way. Rebreo, Yachin Quapa, Yachin Quapa, Yachin Quap. If it's a one shire from so any and the it's a pay one mati pa a tmbo it is a yeah the way we bravo we bravo it is ya chikwa pa ya chikwa I want say a foam so and he and he want say a foam so wamati adi pabia adi abiyo mo yeah 
Somebody lift your boy, let your worship rise up. Lift your voice. Yachi Gua. Oh, be lifted above all other gods. We lay our crown and worship you. We say, be lifted, Lord. Oh, be Lord above all other gods, we lay, we lay our ground, we lay worship. Oh, be lifted, Lord, say, oh, be lifted, be lifted, Lord above.
life is low. A power of the God. We live. We live. We live. Sing glorious God. Oh, glorious God. We live. Come on. Let your words rise up now. Say 
wherever you are, just lift your voice. In the next one minute, just glorify the Lord. Just love the Lord. Just love the Lord. We give you praise, we give you praise, we give you praise, we give you praise. Somebody lift your voice, 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 give him praise, give him praise. I love this song. I want us to sing it and now hand over. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear today may the chain that holds us bound be broken we are the children of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I am the child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am the child of God. Father, we give you our worship. We give you our praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's welcome our pastor, Pastor Carl Basie XL. Can you do it better unto Jesus? Oh, come on. Celebrate the ancient of days. Celebrate the king of kings. Celebrate the, the ever-redeeming, ever-loving one. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. We thank God so much for yet another wonderful Wednesday. And I know that God has something special for every one of you. Some time ago, I was praying, and it was a prayer walk. And I passed by a tree, and the tree had a lot of leaves. And, you know, I, sometimes, you know, you go in prayer because you are bedding with things on your heart, and you want God to, you know, say something to you. You want, you want some quick answers. And sometimes God is not so direct in providing his answers. I needed some response. And, and in prayer, what I could hear the Holy Spirit saying was that, have you seen that tree? I said, what, what, what has this tree got to do with the situation I'm going through? Then he says, can you count the number of leaves on this tree? And I said, how can I know? This tree has several leaves. Then he says, do you know that the hair on your head it's far more than the number of leaves on the tree. And I said, I have not thought about it. Then he says that if I could take particular details of every single hair that is on your head, how much more this situation you are crying about? I know it already. I am concerned already. I am doing something about it already. I am turning the situation to your advantage. Listen, God pays attention to the minutest details of your life. And that is why no matter what is happening in your life, no matter the burden that is on your heart, when it comes to the presence of God, you must let nothing rob you of your joy. So Isaiah chapter 54 says that, sing, O barren woman. He didn't change the narrative that the person was barren, but he says, sing aloud, O barren woman. For many are going to be your children than even the children who of, uh, than even women who have husbands. Listen, may your joy be complete in Jesus' name. I said, may your joy be complete in Jesus' name. May you find a cause of joy for being here tonight. Hallelujah. On this note, I want to welcome you fully into the house of God on behalf of our father, the bishop, 
Reverend Dr. J.K. KVC, I want you to know that you are so welcome to our, our midweek word impact service. It is rich in God's word. It's relevant to make impact in our lives. Hallelujah. Can you help me tonight as we celebrate our father, the bishop? Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise for his life. Hala da 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 da. Is that all you can do? Give the Lord a shout of praise, of celebration for the life of our father, our prophet, our teacher. Hallelujah. And help me appreciate our mother, a solid support for our father. Mama Patricia, God richly bless you for playing a similar role that the Holy Spirit plays in the life of the believer. Doing that in the life of our father. To all the pastors and leaders and our, our mothers. Mama Gloria is in the house. God bless you so much, mommy. Let's celebrate our, 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 our pastors who are in the house. Hallelujah. And today we are heavily represented online as well. Let's celebrate our online viewers. God bless you so much. Abigail, it's always a joy to see you constantly. If you are Risa, Christiana, I can see you. God bless you so much. And finally, those of us in-house, the most anointed of all, please celebrate yourself. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Now we take a prayer and then we go straight into God's word. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Your word is sweet like honey on our lips. May you bless us with your word. May you empower us. May you grant us grace to live your word to the glory of your name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Please, you may humbly be seated. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. Hallelujah. All right. Today's business is very simple. We are continuing with what we started last week. And what was the, the theme for the month? Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Please pardon me. <clears throat> Sorry. So, during Easter, we, just this past Easter, we celebrated so much. Um, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and very soon we'll be celebrating uh, Pentecost, and we'll be celebrating the ascension and all that of a man that I believe strongly you and I possibly have never met in person before, yet we celebrate him. We confess that he is our Lord. Come December, we are going to make noise all over the world. A Savior is born. His name is Jesus Christ. But you and I never saw him physically. What is the foundation of your faith? How do you even convince another person who says that your Bible is not complete? Can you give me any other information aside the Bible that you have buried your head in? That there was truly a man who lived called Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And that is what we are building on. Trying to first and foremost deepen our knowledge about our knowledge and conviction about Jesus Christ. And also equipping ourselves to make a solid defense when we are confronted to defend our faith. The second thing is that so be biara eshia no kase onya me som anasa Christo na wajina tumuno ono ne wine proof pa ne saying you should be able to come out and defend yourself. And so to me a e, di e, Christo who dance here a fata no be who say ampa we a Christo ni ampa hallelujah. So that is the two things. Why are we doing this this particular discussion? First, to deepen our conviction that Jesus Christ is truly who we have believed him to be. And number two, to equip ourselves so that we can make a good defense of our Christian faith when we are confronted. Hallelujah. Like I cited last week, somebody approached, somebody approached uh, our senior associates and he says that, beside this Bible you are quoting, what can you tell me about this Jesus as proof? 
Hallelujah. And we thank God for the grace of God upon his life. He answered, and the person put his hand in his pocket and gave money out. <laughs> what would you have done? Hallelujah. All right. So last week we laid the foundation. And we said that to prove that somebody existed and made impact in the person's in, in life, um, we brought out some four references. Do you remember? Some four references. I asked a simple question that what is the proof that Einstein, um, is it Thomas Edison? Thomas Edison walked on the face of the earth. And we gave interesting references. Somebody says that, I remember a friend saying that, anytime I see light, I remember that somebody brought light into the world. And it's by the name uh, Edison, right? Yes. Another says that, oh, uh, eyewitness account can testify. Another also said that uh, the person's legacies and impact. Another person also said personal experience and encounter. So we settled for these four references. We said that as a rule, a general principle, if somebody had walked on the face of the earth, there must be at least the testimony of eyewitnesses. Please, is that also? Number two, there must be his legacies. We must trace his legacies, the impact the person made on the face of the earth. We even added that you may even want to trace his descendants um, as proof. And also, we also said that um, anyone who has had a personal experience, if I've had a personal experience that somebody lives, you can't convince me that the person <coughs> does not live. So these were the four things that we, we mentioned. And then we narrowed down to the eyewitness account, and we said that um, we want to track the testimonies of the Bible as to who Jesus is. And then we talked about how many testimonies. I think we talked about nine or ten of them. We talked about nine testimonies. And what were some of them? We said that who did God, who did Jesus say he is? We are answering the question, who is Jesus? And, and it is fair, the best person to write myself is yourself. So allow Jesus to say who he is. And then we looked at scripture, and he says that I am the son of the living God. If you are the son of God, what is God saying? Is it true? And then we looked at two accounts of scripture, uh, in the account of the baptism in Matthew chapter 3, and also when transfiguration took place in Matthew chapter 17. And he also said, God said that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We looked at what the disciples said. Peter says that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. We looked at what the demons, uh, we looked at what Satan said. He says, if you are the son of God, Turn this into bread. We looked at what Satan said, the demon said, the demon at Gadarene. He says that, Son of God, I come to cast us out before our time. We looked at even what the Roman soldier said when he died on the cross. The Roman soldier who crucified him, he couldn't help it but say that indeed this one is the Son of God. We looked at different, different testimonies. So by eyewitness account, we can say that truly the testimony that Jesus is the Son of the living God was fully established. Please, I hope you get it. Just by way of um, summary for you to understand. So we use eyewitness approach to define who he is as truly the son of the living God. But we mentioned four methods. We said eyewitness account, we said history, right? So today we are going to use the history approach to prove whether the Jesus you have believed actually lived on the earth actually died, was really buried, really resurrected, is there any historical proof to it? If you lift up your Bible to preach the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, the life of Christ, and the unbeliever says that, I don't believe this is your book, what will you do? <laughs> How will you go about it? Like the way people are saying, oh, uh, those who believe in the word of God, they are naive. They, they just believe anything. This is just stories that have been concocted. Jesus never walked on the face of the earth. Then you believe, and when they are bombarding you with these things, then now when you are you start shaking and you are afraid. But today, after today, you will be able to defend your faith in Jesus' name. I said you'll be able to defend your faith in Jesus' name. All right. So, I just want to make mention of one scripture that may be the core scripture we'll use today. Apart from that, I'm going to use 
a little research, but in a very simplified way to hammer on the life of Jesus. Beyond the Bible, the proof of the life of Jesus. But first and foremost, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Just for you to appreciate how important what we are doing is concerned. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. All right. This is what the Bible says. It says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for your hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Can we look at another version of scripture? Just appreciate this. All right. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. Hallelujah. So if you're a believer and you are not prepared enough to be able to answer the reason for your hope, it means that you can be tossed about anyhow. But may you be well grounded as a child of God. Today's believers, we are many, but we are shallow. The slightest wind, then we are tossed about. But may you be deeply rooted in Jesus' name. I said, may you be deeply rooted in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. All right. So if you are confronted that beyond your Bible, prove that Jesus really existed. What, what do you do? I'm going to help you. In a very simplified form. Are you ready? Do you want to know it? All right. So, fine. Apart from the eyewitness, one of the references is, historically, it is proving that Jesus, he lived on the earth. He died on the earth. He was buried. And guess what? It is historically proven that his tomb is empty. That means that, and yes, sir, ya tibibi na ya jiedi keke. But, ye wo fapimbi e wo, even in life, that what we have believed actually existed, prevailed, and it's true. Are you getting it? Now, so, first and foremost, we are saying that, let's hear from history, from research, of even unbelievers, secular people, what they have discovered when they try to search whether Jesus exists or not. Now, the simple thing you must ask yourself first and foremost, that Jesus' world, when Jesus lived, um, which category of people were living I think it is the people, category of people who are living at that time that can be the best researchers that we can consult. Is that not so? All right. So, in the world of Jesus, which category of people were, were there? Which group of people can we make mention of that? Oh, Jesus had on the normal hall. We have the Pharisees. Uh -huh. We have the what again? The far to cease. We have the, the Sadducees. The sad to cease. And then, <laughs> what again? So, when you put them together, you had the Jews. Is that also? You had Jews, uh, people of Judea, who lived at that time. I think we should be interested in what they really have to say about Jesus. Is that also? Apart from the Jews, which other group of people existed? We had the Romans. Good. We had the Romans. We will have the, the Hebrews, and the Hebrews are actually the Jews as well. So, uh, the Jews were also addressed as the Hebrews by some um, external nations, okay? So, yes. So, we had the Romans, okay? At the time of Jesus, the superpowers at that time was what? The Romans. So, if we can find out from some Jewish researchers about whether truly Christ lived, and we can also confirm from the testimony of some Romans who are researchers, I think we have a solid reference point. Is that not so? Please, do you agree with me? I get to the point. See, to me, to the Jews, for Nibia, not Munye Christopho, the Omoka, yeah, Efa Christ, one. That's yet to me, Sansu, you shame the Roman for no so Kafa Christ, one. What is Sammy and Nubuma? Say Nipano, so Casa Menji Bible to Tunkra, where ye the research truth has been established. Hallelujah. All right. So we are going to, because you had the Romans, we had the, the Jews, and of course, we had the followers of Jesus Christ, that is the Christians. And the testimony of the followers of Jesus Christ is what we have in the New Testament. Please, I hope you are getting it. Uh, but people are saying that don't make reference to that, still preach Christ. No problem. 
Even if they say, don't touch New Testament, only Old Testament, we will preach the gospel. Because Christ has been preaching the gospel from the Garden of Eden, from the foundation of the earth, through to now, Christ has been preaching the gospel. You can never silence the gospel. Hallelujah. All right. So let's take a quick look at history. I won't bore you with so much information. I'm just going to mention three names. Okay? I'm going to mention three names. Now there are two, Oboto. Anytime an unbeliever, an atheist consult, he said, that, look, is there any historical proof of Christ? Tell them that, look, I'm going to mention three names. <laughs> to prove that the works of these people gives proof that truly what is written in the Bible is true. Amen. All right. Um, I think I may have to lay a foundation. Let me teach you something. In the, in the account of the Bible, anytime you want to find out whether somebody lived, one of the evidence to prove that somebody lived within a particular period of time is to find out the ruler who reigned during that period. Please, I hope you are getting it. Uh -huh. So, if somebody, for example, you want to say that, oh, uh, Osimesi was born during the time that His Excellency, former President Kufo, was the president of Ghana. That alone should tell you that the person was born between the time range of what? The year 2000 to the year 2008. If he, was, if he was born in the reign of President Kufo, he has to be within that time range. Please, I hope you are getting it. Uh -huh. So, when a king's name is mentioned as a reference point, one of the reasons we make reference to the king is for you to know the period in which somebody lived. And I'm going to give you an interesting example. Okay. The Bible says that in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And many a time you would have a number of us saying that if that is the case, every King Uzziah in our lives must die so that we will see the Lord. <laughs> have you heard that sermon before? That's a powerful one. But what you are trying to say is that if Hosea does not die, God cannot show you his glory. That's what you are saying. <laughs> That's what you are saying. You are also saying that he set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That one too cannot happen. Hosea must die. <laughs> but that scripture had nothing to do with. In any case, when you check the history of Israel, King Hosea was one of the godly kings. He was not a wicked king. Yes, he made a mistake and he was punished, but he was one of the godly kings in the account of the kings of Judah. So why are you killing him? <laughs> but we make reference to the year that King Uzziah died so that you can have an idea of the, the time in which God revealed himself to Isaiah. That's all that Isaiah was saying. That, look, I want you to know the period in which this event I'm talking about happened. It happened at the time, in that year. So we can easily track historically the year that King Uzziah died. And we can use that time frame to say that, oh, this is the time God appeared to Isaiah. Please, have you learned something? Uh, so please, don't go and kill anybody, all right? <laughs> you are safe. <laughs> all right. So you can ask yourself. So it is historically proven by the account of more than five witnesses, both Jews and Romans, this is just by way of foundation, that Jesus Christ, he truly lived, and he lived under the reign of two kings. There's evidence to the period in which he lived on the face of the earth. And once we mention the names of these kings, it means that you can go to history and truly prove the time frame that Christ lived. I get to the point. So number one, Christ lived at the time of King Herod the Great. And King Herod the Great is not just a Bible character. He is a historical character. But what I say? He truly existed. So if you want to find out some things about Christ, you can visit the time of Herod the Great and you will find details about Jesus Christ. Okay? So King Herod the Great at least saw the early moments of Jesus Christ. And then when he died of the scene, his kingdom was ruled by four different kings. Four people took over from him. Okay, there's a lady in the crowd. One Salome was, was there. One of the rulers, Salome. One is Philip. One is, I think I have the names here, but I don't want to bore you with names. But, so Jesus reigned in the time of, the, uh, lived at the time of Herod and continued to live in the time when these four kings reigned. It's called the Tetrarchy. Aha. So, the uh, Herodian Tetrarchy. So, 
Yes, within this particular period, you can trace this period. And within the period, you can find out details of a man whose name is Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. And you'll find out that within that period, a man walked the face of the earth and his name was Jesus of Nazareth. And they have restor- historical account to prove that that was the period in which he lived. Hallelujah. And they also acknowledge, when you research and, and go into that time, they will tell you that this man who is called Jesus of Nazareth began to teach and to live in a way, and his teachings and his life began a whole movement that was called the Christian movement. So Christianity is not just like, oh, yakani ya jedi. Christianity has restor- historical what? Emphasis. It started within the period where a man ruled and his subordinates continued to rule after him. And within that period, a man by the name Jesus of Nazareth passed through the lands of the earth. Hallelujah. So please, Jesus is not a story. Jesus is a reality. A historically proven reality. Hallelujah. Now, let's go to my first witness. He's called Josephus. I won't give you the full name, but put it in your pocket. Anytime you meet an unbeliever who says that uh, beyond the Bible, proof from any form of research work, the existence of Jesus, tell him that there was a Jewish researcher who was called Josephus. And Josephus lived within the first century that Jesus also lived within. And the good news is that his research works still exist. And also the interesting news was that he was never a Christian. So you cannot say that he's speaking a biased testimony. To say, say, they are speaking an adulterated truth. In fact, some of the names I'll mention, they were enemies of Christ. Yet their testimony confirmed that truly he lived, he died, he was crucified, and his tomb is empty. The first one is Josephus. And he did his research in the first century. Okay, and I'll not bore you with the dates, 93 to 94 CE. Okay, now, this is what Josephus has written in his book. The collection of his writings is called The Antiquities of the Jews. The Antiquities of the Jews. When you say antiquities, it's simply saying um, ancient records and references that precedes what we call the Middle Age. So, very ancient uh, documents put together. So, he had writings that are very, very old, that are put together, and they have named it the Antiquities of the Jews. Okay, the Antiquities of the Jews. In his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, he did a thorough research about the Jews, and in the process, he made mention of two characters in the New Testament. Number one, he made mention of John the Baptist, and he made mention of Jesus of Nazareth. And he says that there was a wise teacher, a virtuous man, whose name was Jesus of Nazareth. He was truly baptized of John the Baptist, and he was crucified by a Roman prefect called Pontius Pilate. Hallelujah. And the, and, and the interesting thing is that some of his writings can still be chanced on. He's been preserved, and you can make reference to Josephus. So, Josephus is saying is that he testifies that there was a man who lived in his time whose name was Jesus of Nazareth. And he did not die just an ordinary death. He was genuinely crucified by a Roman official called Pontius Pilate. And he described him also as a wise teacher and as a virtuous man. I thought you said virtuous women who can find, and then we say faithful man. But men are also virtuous. Let's see the virtuous men in the house. Virtuous men, we are here. <laughs> we are not scarce anymore. We are available. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this is the testimony of Josephus, a Jew who had not believed in Jesus. Yet this is, this is what I'm saying about. In fact, other writings prove that he actually, from the prophetic research, of the Jews, concluded that Jesus is the Messiah. 
But that one, many are debating that, hey, Josephus didn't say that. Even if he didn't say it, what he said is that Jesus lived on the earth. He was truly crucified. And that is what the New Testament says. That our Lord Jesus lived on the face of the earth. And he didn't die a normal death. He died a crucified death. Hallelujah. So this is what Josephus is saying. When they tell you that, oh, the only thing you know is the Bible. Tell them that I know of Josephus and the antiquities of the Jews. If you say you are an intellectual, go and read about Josephus and his statement on Christ. And you will know that they are extra biblical support to what I believe. I have not believed just anything by faith. I have believed on the grounds of knowledge, understanding, and research. Hallelujah. But you may say, Papa, your friend is saying, but your friend is saying, Josephus, when you meet any stubborn soul, tell the person, have you heard of what Josephus said? We saw say no Bible no chapter there. Catch and say any Bible mu, but the supporting Bible. It's also unpaid the whole Bible mu. They make a supporting scripture. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. So yes, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is the testimony of Joseph. And Joseph was a was a Jew. I can give you other Jewish accounts, but not to trouble you so much. Now, my second witness that we will call into the witness box. Please don't forget this name. His name is very close to Osofo Titus' name. But the name is a little longer. <laughs> Osofo Titus' name is five-letter words. This one is seven-letter words. He's called Tacitus. Please, will you remember? Tacitus. Tacitus. <laughs> Tacitus. Now, Tacitus is another person. He was not a Jew. He didn't care about your religious affiliation. He didn't even like the believers. Tacitus' account described believers as people who were overly superstitious people. Just said, you know, they are just raising their hopes. That is how he described the Christians. So if he is saying something to confirm what the Bible has said, it should tell you that there is no sense of what? Biasness. Watch what he has said. He's not trying to please believers in any way. He's just saying the truth as it is. And Tacitus was a Roman researcher. A Roman historian. He even was nominated as a senator of Rome. So this is a high profile person. That if you want to do double cross checking of what he said about Jesus, when you go online, you will go and find him. So if any intellectual says that, oh, Jesus never, there's no proof. The only thing you know is you are quoting the Bible. Tell them that, look, have you heard of that Roman senator and historian who made a good testimony about the man Jesus? Go and research. Hallelujah. But you see a friend is saying, Tacitus, shout Tacitus. Am I helping you at all? All right. Interesting. Now, this is what Tacitus said. He acknowledged the existence of Christians in Rome as highly superstitious believers. However, he acknowledged that Jesus was crucified by one of his Roman prefects by the name Pontius Pilate. Please, I hope you are getting it. So, a Roman official is saying that on record in the annals of the Roman history, one of their leaders crucified a man by the name Jesus of Nazareth. And he was crucified by that man Pontius Pilate. So you cannot tell me that Jesus did not live on the earth. He never existed. It's a story we believe. No. Me far me know, but I have enough evidence. That's number one. You cannot tell me that his crucifixion is false news. Because the people that facilitated his death, their historians have recorded it in their annals. The book that Tacitus wrote was called The Annals. The Annals. When you look at the Annals of Tacitus, you will see in there, he acknowledging that Jesus, the Lord of Christians, was truly arrested, was maltreated, and was crucified. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Tastor says that 
Jesus was crucified and all that. And interestingly, in his book, in his 15th book, chapter number 44, he even records the account of the early believers, what they went through. So Tacitus records how Christians were accused in the time of Emperor Nero, okay, in AD 64. So these are historical evidence. You can prove it that, look, Christianity existed back then. And in AD 64, Christians were accused of causing a very huge fire outbreak. You see, almost, almost the whole of the Roman, a large place of the Roman Empire. And though they were not guilty, Emperor Nero falsely accused the Christians, the believers. I get to the point. And based on that, many believers, many believers were released to dogs. And dogs tore their skins apart. And that is how they died. Others were used in the night as torchlights. Do you know how they were used as torchlights? They were tied and they were set on fire. And the fire that came was what they used in the night for entertainment. Believers were burnt alive. Burnt alive to provide light at night. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, today when they say come for this, you start calculating the number of sleep you've had and all that. You do all kinds of calculations. We are living in a pampered generation. We are in a season of pampered Christianity. How many of you agree with me? Yeah. It's pampered Christianity. I was sharing a story. There's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book. Please, when you time, read that book. Your life will change. Your Christian life will change. A woman was being set on fire. They were burning her. And as she was being burnt, she was preaching to the soldier that, was, that set her on fire. All she needed to know preach you. She was just preaching. Until she lost her last breath preaching. She preached till she got burnt totally. The moment she got burnt totally, the soldier that was receiving the message also says, I want to accept the Lord that a woman can die such a mysterious death for and still have hope. So please, just like I did to this woman, I have surrendered to Jesus. Set me ablaze. I am ready to die. What a beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah. And these are all accounts that Tacitus recorded. Not from a religious perspective. Not from a Christian New Testament perspective, he was simply recording facts. And the fact is that a man lived on the earth, he died, his tomb is empty, and he has given so much hope beyond death that people are ready to die and know that even after death, there is hope. What the Lord we serve. He has defeated death. He has defeated the grave. Even the worst form of death, he continues to live afterwards. And we can take hope in the fact that even when we die, even for him, we will continue to live. What a Lord we serve. Can you put your hands together and celebrate the Lord? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So at least you've heard of Josephus, you've heard of Tacitus. There are several names, but I'll just mention maybe the last one or two. There's another one that I know you may forget, so don't worry. He's called Suetonius. Suetonius. That, that one looks, the, Tacitus looks so much like Osofu Titus' name. Suetonius looks so much like Osofu Ishere's name. So at least, if you forget Suetonius, kindly remember Osofu Ishere's name. <laughs> Suetonius, that is S-U-E-T-O-N-I-U-S. I'm glad you want to know the spelling, at least. It tells me you are with me. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure it's not academic at all. But I want, to know, I want you to also be equipped when you step out there. So, Suetonius, S-U-E-T-O-N-I-U-S. And Suetonius, also in, he's also a Roman. He also confirmed that Christ's death was by crucifixion. The worst form of punishment that a man could ever experience was reported by Christ's death. Now, there is, so you can ask Suetonius, there's another guy. I'll mention his name. Onutumus, a guy, he's a young man. He's called, uh, is it Pliny? 
Pliny the, Pliny the Younger. That's his name. Pliny the Younger. And he, he took over an, a, a whole empire in Bithynia. And there was confusion because uh, Christians were not being um, allowed to focus on Christ and serve their God. And there were so many attacks. And uh, Pliny was made in charge of Bithynia. And he comes to meet this situation. He says that this one, I don't know what to do. So he talks to his boss, who was called Trajan. And then Trajan says that these people, it will be difficult to condemn their Christ because he died. But his tomb is empty. Number two, you cannot lay any charge. You cannot lay any charge against them. Yet you must not allow them to. <laughs> so you must create <laughs> some charges by force. So get the charges that uh, Pliny, some of the charges that they raised against Christians. Number one, they said they were practicing incest. Do you know incest? Incest is you marry your brother or your sister. So the believers were accused of doing incest. And do you know why? Because they were calling themselves brothers and sisters. And they were marrying. <laughs> so, and as simple as this is, they will be hanged on the cross. They will be given to the dogs. They will be set on fire. Another charge that was given was that they were cannibals. Do you know cannibals? Cannibals eat flesh and they drink blood. So he said, oh, these people, they are cannibals. Do you know why? Because Jesus said, this bread I break, it is my body. It's my body in remembrance of me. And this cup of wine, it is my blood. Drink. So they make reference that, said that oh, they are practicing cannibalism and we can't take it straight to the circles, given to dogs, bent, crucified. Some were, were beaten, they put rope on the neck of, some of them, they dragged them on the floor, they stoned them to death. These people were willing to die. Why do you think they were willing to die? They were willing to die because of one word, resurrection. If Christ had not resurrected, if the tomb was not empty, all these people who sacrificed their lives, they would have sacrificed it in futility. But they knew that there was hope beyond death. That there is a better place we are going. That Christ's testimony that he goes to prepare a better place for us is a solid testimony. And you know, never sacrifice Christ for money that you will not spend in heaven. Can I say that again? Never sacrifice Christ for money that will be rendered irrelevant in heaven. Never sacrifice Christ for the enticement and the enjoyment of the young lady that will not be with you in heaven, but will be with you in hell. Never. They had hope beyond death. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So I've mentioned some three names. Can you mention at least some three names? Then I'll, I'll speak a little about the empty tomb. And then we, we, we build on from there. I think, all right. Yes, what's the first name that was mentioned? Josephus. And I said, who was he? He was a Jewish historian. And anything, anytime anybody wants to prove whether what he said is true, you can go into history and then you can prove it. Hallelujah. So Josephus is one of our historical proofs. Yes, number two is what? Let's come again. Tacitus. Titus redefined. Tacitus. I'm saying it so that you'll remember. <laughs> Tacitus. And he was a Roman historian. He acknowledged that Jesus of Nazareth lived on the face of the earth. His life and his teachings began a movement called the Christian movement. And he was arrested, crucified, and buried by one of their very own Roman official called Pontius Pilate. So, what the Bible, the Bible is not a historical book, but every historical account is accurate. The Bible is not a geography book, but every geographical report is accurate. The Bible is not just a counseling book, but every form of counseling that the Bible has meted out has given perpetual solutions to life. Hallelujah. The Bible is not a book of names, but every name that was mentioned in the Bible existed. They lived and they proved that indeed there is, historic, there is good account of what we have come to believe. 
Don't allow anything to shake your faith. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. amen. So, at least, from what I've said, you know that there is proof of his existence. Up to the point of his death. Is that not so? All right. What about his resurrection? Is there any historical proof? Well, there has been a major debate on believing scholars, believing scholars, atheists, and all that. But all their debates, all their debates have centered on three issues. Number one, is the tomb empty? Number two, is there any proof that he appeared to his disciples? And number three, how did the Christian faith begin? These are the three questions they have asked. The most significant of all is that is the tomb empty? Is the tomb empty? Because the believers have been accused. Some have said that Christ Jesus, he never died. Others have said that he's still locked up in the grave. Others have also said that, oh, uh, it is just some stories that we are being told. Okay. But these unbelieving scholars have done what we call archaeological studies. Archaeology is when you study um, ancient materials, natural ancient materials to discover uh, lifelong or old truths that have been established. And they themselves came to the confirmation that the tomb that Jesus was buried in was in a public sphere. Yeah, tomb, you know, and yet it wasn't in a hidden place. The tomb of Jesus was in the heart of a public place. It was like a, which cemetery would you? <laughs> An open cemetery. When you are passing by Gethsemane, you see that yes, Utu when you be unconscious how you see it. I get to me. And it wasn't like it was very just done that you see that. So you could you could publicly attest through archaeological research that up the tomb for a long period of time had remained what empty. I get it. Now, to prove that it's empty, you must quote the enemies of Jesus Christ. I get to the point. Now, what did the enemies of Jesus say? They said that. Let's fabricate a lie that they have taken the body and they have done what? They have hidden it to prove their resurrection. Now, if you give this explanation, you are indirectly affirming that then the tomb is empty. <laughs> Please, I don't know whether you're getting me. Because if the tomb is not empty, you wouldn't look for an explanation for it. So even every attempt to disapprove the emptiness of the tomb added to the evidence that indeed the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. I get it. The tomb is empty. Another accusation was that the spices they put on Jesus brought him back from coma. He didn't die. He, was, he fell into coma. And he was able to push a rock that it takes more than two soldiers to put there. Somebody whose feet, two feet, had been nailed together on the cross. And he had fallen into coma and he has come back. Can he even walk in the first place? Not to talk of half the strength. Having not drank water and food for three days or three nights. To have the strength to push it. Even that is a miracle. <laughs> even that, if that is so, even that is a miracle. They said the sea was not split. Uh, the Red Sea and Canada was not split. And then uh, they walked on. They walked at the shallow part of the sea. If they walked at the shallow part of the sea, and the shallow part of the sea swallowed an entire Egyptian army, it is equally a miracle. <laughs> Whatever you do, a miracle has taken place. No matter what you do, you can never ever subject the power of God as far as human nature is concerned. Hallelujah. And that's the God we serve. I thought you put your hands together. Yes. Meanwhile, the account says that even the spices, on the day they were going to apply the spices, they didn't even know how they were going to roll the stone. So which spices woke Jesus up? <laughs> the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. 
I said, the tomb is empty. Hallelujah. The tomb was in a public space. And Jesus could not be found there. Funny enough, nobody could go to the extent of locating the body of Jesus Christ if it had been hidden. Their own research came to a conclusion that there was no search for the body of Jesus if it had been taken from the tomb. I get to the point. And the Roman scholars who were not believers debunked the argument of other people who were saying that he didn't die after going through crucifixion because it would be an insult to the Romans to say that they were able to crucify a person and the person didn't die. It's an insult to them. Because it is their most highly esteemed way of killing. <laughs> and you see, your whole weight, you see, when you are breathing, science says that there's a, a kind of upward movement in your breathing. Now, Christ was hanging there, and all his weight, all his weight was down to that nail that was at his feet. And he couldn't even breathe. And to confirm your death, they must break your bones. It is a historically certified fact that this is how the Romans, this is how they go through their crucifixion. <laughs> and when they pierce you and both water and blood comes, it is one of the affirmations of your death. Roman research clearly spelled out. Can you tell me that even beyond biblical reference, that I don't have a proof that my Lord, who was clearly, plainly stated that he was crucified, that he died on the cross for me, you can't disprove it. Please, I hope you are getting it. And this is how solid you should be as a believer. Your confidence should be so strong when you are talking to that, look, the Jews are, they are, they, they are truth, inevitable truth. The far Roman, they are inevitable truths. Even extra-biblical research, they are inevitable truths. There is even an argument. It is called the criteria of embarrassment. Let me share that one with you, then maybe I'll pause for questions. Do you know the criteria of embarrassment? It's very simple. Why will Christians, two, two things, why will Christians, okay, tell a story of their most highly esteemed personality and present a very disgraceful picture of him? I get to the point. Look at his death. Look at the embarrassment surrounding his death. If you were truly a loyal believer and you were, wanted to hide truth, will you, will you describe this kind of shame about somebody you are celebrating as the son of God, the Lord of Lords? You will never. But the criterion of embarrassment says that because it was a, the truthful fact, it had to be presented as it is. Please, I hope you are getting it. Yeah. That is it. We say that, oh, Oshie Jesus moving on here in Tumar, Qatar. Please, there was no in Tumar. When Jesus hung there, research has proven it was 100% nakedness. Roman crucifixion, which cloth? You are there naked. Even those acting the movies, they are trying to preserve their dignity by covering that place. But Jesus hung on the cross, naked. Now, if it wasn't an actual truth and we celebrate him as our Lord, is that the picture we paint about him? That is the criterion of embarrassment. Please, I hope you are getting the picture. Yeah. But he died that kind of death. And he explained why he died that death. But the truth is that death could not keep him down the grave. He arose. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Hallelujah. Amen. The second thing about the theory of embarrassment is that why would people go through so much, so much, just to preserve one truth if it is not true? Why? Why would they go through so much for a man to be crucified and he says that I don't deserve to be crucified the way my Lord was crucified, turned me upside down. And research has proven that it is more painful to die upside down than to be down, to be, to be, to die that way. Because blood now flows in the opposite direction into your brains. The, the, the criterion 
of embarrassment. That's how I want to conclude this presentation. Why would people say that I'm being cast into the public square where my body is going to be eaten by wild dogs? And they say, deny the fact that Jesus resurrected. And you say that I cannot deny the fact that he resurrected. Why would they go through such embarrassment for falsehood? If you were the son of John the Baptist, or, or John uh, the Beloved, and they cast your son, uh, if you were the mother, and they cast your son into boiling hot oil, you the mother, what would you say? What would be your testimony? But there was no other testimony. The, the criterion of what? Embarrassment. If it was not true, why would they go through all this? For the gospel. Some were beaten with clubs. Their head, they were squashed until their head burst into two. And the elements of their brain were spilled all over the floor. Yet they said they would not deny Jesus. If his resurrection, which provides life after death, was not true, why would they gladly sacrifice their lives if there is no life after death? The tomb is empty. How many scriptures have I quoted today? I quoted one. And what was that about? Defend your faith. Apart from that, we have used a whole dialogue outside the Bible, but still confirming everything the Bible said. The Bible, as we have it, is the true account of Christ. What we have believed, we should never trade it for any other thing because it is historically proven. Jesus lived we know the time he lived. His miracles were affirmed. His death is confirmed. His burial is confirmed. The emptiness of the tomb is confirmed. The affirmation that indeed he appeared to his disciples is confirmed by the criterion of, embar of embarrassment. That no matter, they were ready to pay the highest price because they were convicted that Christ has appeared to them. Even Paul's life, is historically confirmed that he was once persecuting the people called Christians. And at another point, he had had a change and he was now preaching the gospel of the Christians. It is historically confirmed. So Paul alone is an evidence on historical grounds from the Roman perspective that of a truth. Christ, he encountered men even after death. He appeared to men and he encountered men. Can you put your hands together and celebrate God? Are you proud you're a Christian? Are you proud you're a child of God? Is Jesus a story? He's a reality. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. I'll pause here. Time is fast spent. Forgive me. But at least we must give room for some um, few, just some few questions. Please, if you have some few questions or maybe you've come across some interesting evidence. Some interesting evidence or you read some details also that can add to the argument. That from a historical perspective, we can prove the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Or you don't understand anything, please, you can just draw my attention and then we address it. Hallelujah. All right. Yes, Ruby. Um, Bright, can you help with the microphone? If you have a question, feel free to ask. Hallelujah. This year is send the light. You will go and meet somebody who will ask you some things. <laughs> All right, Ruby. I just wanted to add a little bit that All right. worldwide, it is understood that BC, in dating, BC is accepted as before Christ. Mm -hmm. And then Anno Domini, AD, is the year of our Lord. So we start counting AD from when Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. So I'm just so confused that. If we can date as BC, before Christ, then he came. Uh -huh. Because if he didn't come, there wouldn't be a before Christ to be talking about. Mm -hmm. And then under Domina, yes, it's um, after, the day. After, after, the, uh, after Jesus came and then he died. So it's just, 
I just don't yeah. understand why people cannot they understand. just can't see the black and white yeah and and it will interest you to know that because of this argument they changed bc and ad because for a long time that alone was enough evidence of christ's existence and his impact to the extent he had changed the calendar of events yet they changed it so now we have bce and we have ce and the c there is not christ before common era <laughs> and then the ce is now common era <laughs> <laughs> they have changed it. But the funny thing is that even your common era begins with his death. <laughs> he still defines when your CE begins and where your BCE ends. Our Lord Jesus will continue to reign. In the midst of all the arguments, he reigns supreme. He is the Lord of all. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a good one. Thank you. So even the calendar of events reveal his existence. Please. Anything to add or any question to ask before we wrap up? All right. Uh, Ruby again. Um, I, this is just a comment. I think we should really um, study crucifixion. Uh, the, the actual crucifixion. Yeah. Not wha what we picture it on TV mm -hmm. when it's shown in movies or something like that. Because sometimes I, I feel like we kind of gloss over, we, we, we what I want to say is the, um, the times we are in, we are not subjected to like barbarism. Yes. So we, I think sometimes we don't comprehend mm -hmm. what it is when we say Jesus was crucified. So sometimes you might, like the weight of it, not even just the fact that he died, but what he had to go, go through, through to die. Yeah. I think we need to sometimes, maybe in smaller settings like this, we need to. Envision clearly. Yes. 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 You are right. You are right. You are right. You know, he went through different punishment. What Jesus went through, you can split it as different punishment for people. There were people who were last 39 minus 1, uh, 40 minus 1. And that was their only punishment, too. Because the 40th strike will kill you. When they lash you, Romans lash you, for, and their, their, their whips had hooks at the tip. So when they whip you, before they remove their whip, it tears a part of your body. So anybody, it was scientifically proven that when you receive the 40th lash, bam, you are dead. So for them to let the pain enter you small before you die, they receive the last one. You see, and that was just somebody's punishment. But to go through that, carry the cross, have tongues put on your head, pierce through your brains for blood to come out, for blood to be oozing throughout, and they make a mockery that you are saying the crown that you are you are Jesus, the king of the Jews. This is your crown. And carry that load at the back. Climb one of the high mountains. Gogota was not a halo, it was a mountain. Climb a mountain with that load. Up there. Be nailed, not in the palms, but in the nerves. The, one of the most painful places to nail a person. In the nerve cells, just at the wrist. And your whole waist, your whole weight is being held. It is this painful moment that is holding your whole body up there. Together with a six inches, going through the bones of your ankle too, put together, piercing through a wound. And when you are thirsty, they give you the most bitter liquid in life. They give you a kind of vinegar, high soap to drink. And we are here living pampered Christianity. May God have mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. So, Obisu Bisa said, Tama Yawu Yesuno. Satam and Nehono, Asuka Triana Snow, a woho. Na, a young four and a fine and no more, or Mutimibe, whom he said, Yawu Yesu, a brana, a wooden niho, a snow na ato, a wooden niho, a moana, and so yet young will say. All right. Yes, the argument, this is not Easter, but the argument that what is the proof that Jesus was birth in December. So in December, we don't celebrate the birth date of Jesus Christ. 
we celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ. And you know what I mean? Easter. This Easter we celebrated. It's not the day that Jesus, Good Friday is not the day. Jesus did not die. Yeah, 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 March one. Jesus did not die in March <laughs> according to the Jewish calendar. It is a day that we've all come to agree that if truly he's worth celebrating, let's find a day to celebrate him. So, no Christian is saying that Jesus was born on the 25th December. If you're a Christian, you also say that Jesus was born on the... Sanyom you're correct. Mary's born time. Was born on Christmas Day. But what we are saying importantly is that we must celebrate his birth. I get it. And the world could have chosen the month of March to celebrate his birth. But what is important, they say, if he is worth celebrating, let's celebrate him, irrespective of the day. So, yes, it's true. In the Hebrew context and all that, that season was a snowy day, and so you cannot even come and say that uh, uh, the shepherds flock by night and all that. You see, so you can go so much into it. But me, what is important is that Jesus was born and we must celebrate his birth. So we celebrate his birth. We don't celebrate the date of his birth. But just what I say. Ah, that's all. All right. Can we take the last one because of time? Yes, please. Please, is there a question or a contribution? Hallelujah. Amen. Believers that time no. I did it for now. They certify themselves for death. They kill some. They give some to those and destroy some. Then I'm asking that we believers now, can we do what they did? We call ourselves Christians, but we fear witches. We not say the truth. If we ourselves, we hate ourselves. How can we follow God? Like how the disciples, the people who died for that time. So I they give to people, let them answer me. Because as we are here, people cry, they know they like themselves. They hate themselves. In the churches, we have enemies over there. In the churches, we have people who hate people. People, people who destroy people. We cannot follow God. We are not true Christians. So I'm the asking people that, are we believers or not? Interesting. I don't know, maybe um, uh, Reverend Eddie and the pastors, uh, please, with your permission, we answer this question. No, not you answer it, but we answer this question and then we are done because of time. Okay. But I want us to answer this question. What, what, is, what is today's Christian? What is our problem? <laughs> what is really the deal? That's the question he's asking. Can we sacrifice when they say that uh, a Adam, the dogs are waiting for you, Jesus or no Jesus? Can we do that? And if we can't, what, what, is, what is the challenge of today's Christian as far as these persecutions and things are concerned? Please, can we say something about this then we wrap up with it? What is really our issue? It's the same question I was asking myself when I was preparing this. Yes. Bookie, I want to say something. What is it? Why are we struggling to sacrifice? All right. Thank you very much, Reverend. <laughs> so maybe let me help. Um, you know, Jesus said something. He said, if any man wants to come after me, um, what you do is to deny yourself and take out the cross. I think the problem with the church is the fact that we proclaim that we love him, but we've not gotten to the point of denying ourselves. What we rather do is the give me and what I will get out of him. But the self-denial aspect where that will cause you to sacrifice, die, be ready to defend and fight for him at any cost. Or just like you said, they say, the dog, I like what you just said. You said the dog, something, something. The dogs are waiting outside. The dogs are waiting outside. Jesus Would you or be, no Jesus. Yes, Jesus or no Jesus. 
Will you be ready? So the problem with the church is the self-denial. Mm -hmm. we, we, yes, we love him. And like he rightly said, these people proclaim with their mouth that they love me, but their heart is far away. Mm -hmm. So that's where the church, the problem is the self. You see, we think about ourselves yeah. than the sacrifice we have to. Yeah. So that's all I have to say. God bless you. Please, let's help me celebrate Reverend. I think he's... The problem is ourselves. We love self than we love Christ. We are so glued to self and we are so glued to the pleasures that self gets from the world. You want Jesus to come? No, 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 no. Wait, I've, I've not married yet. <laughs> Honey, a poem here. Yeah. Poem. <laughs> Hallelujah. Please, let's put our hands together. And celebrate yourself. You've been wonderful students. God bless you so much. I was wondering how you will absorb today's uh, lesson, but you've done well. You've done well. So let's summarize. We mentioned three names. Number one, Josephus. Number two, Tacitus. Number three, Sidonius. All right. All right. Sidonius. And then we said to talk about the resurrection, there are three things we must, we must ask ourselves. Number one, is the tomb really empty? Number two, did he really appear to his disciples? And number three, how exactly did Christianity start? And to answer all these three, we said that with the tomb, it was a public space. Everybody could attest, and research has proven that it was a public square that you could see its emptiness. Number two, even the enemies of Christ tried to fabricate a story to explain the emptiness, which is an evidence of its emptiness in itself. And then we also said that the criteria or the criterion of embarrassment, that if we want to preserve Jesus as our Lord, why would we falsify information to describe such an embarrassing experience of his? And why would we also be ready to go through such embarrassment to the point of death if it is not based on truth? And these are some of the evidence that you bring to bear when you meet an unbeliever. Hallelujah. I think we've done one. Can we be on our feet shortly? Can you thank God for the cross, for the blood, and for the empty tomb? Lift up your voice and just thank God. Thank God. Thank God that he arose. Thank God Jesus arose. Thank God Jesus is alive. Thank God Jesus truly resurrected. We have every proof. We have every fact. Jesus was truly crucified. He arose. Hadabado, Shadabadaba, Rabadaba, Rosedebedebo, Shadabakatunimi Kapa. Oh, what a glorious story. What I have believed is not a myth. What I have believed is not a fable. What I have believed is the truth. That the man, Jesus of Nazareth, walked on the face of the earth, died a sacrificial death on the cross, that I may live. And he arose, he arose, glory to Jesus. The foundation of our Christian faith is that he arose. The foundation is that he resurrected. And if he did, we shall also resurrect, even after death. Father, we thank you. We give you glory for the hope we have. We have an anchor that keeps our soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Our anchor will hold in times of need. We thank you. We thank you for the assurance we have in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Can you put your hands together? Hallelujah. On this special occasion, we just want to give our offering to God. Take an offering that is worthy of the cross and take an offering that is worthy of giving. And with a heart of gladness, just give in celebration that Christ is truly historically proven. He's dead. He's risen. Our beloved ones online, God bless you so much. Please, the various avenues to give your seed is on the screen. You can just look at it, and then you can also give to that effect. All right. 
Father, we thank you for our seed. We give it in two, for two reasons. To say thank you for how far you have brought us. And to say we connect to your covenant blessings. That it will be made manifest in our lives. We give from a cheerful heart. And we know you will bless us from your love and kindness. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please you can come and then drop your seed. And as you come, we would also receive. Okay. We we'll also receive Reverend, Reverend, officially Reverend Richmond Inshira Ekins, whose name is close to Sidonius, to come and officially bless us, close us, and release us. Oh, come on, just celebrate him. Celebrate him even as he comes. Man of God, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, please, have you learned something this evening? I have heard some new things for myself. So not only can the Bible, the Bible be our only source to prove that our Savior truly lived on earth and that he did what he did to save us, but history over the years had also proven that Christ lived and died. Hallelujah. Amen. Please, let's rise up on our feet. We want to pray and close. Please, next week, invite a friend. Invite a loved one. Let's share this. In fact, these messages are messages that are meant for this end time. Because if you can truly defend your faith, wherever you go, you can stand on your two feet and believe in God. If you are not able to defend your faith, you will deny Jesus. And it won't be long that such moments will come to us. Hallelujah. Let's pray. And so, Father, we thank you for such a wonderful time of your word. We thank you for giving us the grace. Thank you for the vessel that you used tonight. We ask that your spirit will help him, anoint him the more with wisdom and understanding that any time he stands here, there will be precision in his delivery. In the name of Jesus, Father, we soak ourselves into your hand. That we will not just be hearers, but we will be doers of your word. That this will go a long way to affirm and to give us confidence when we go out there to minister and to preach your word. Father, as we leave here, your presence, we ask that, dear Lord, may your presence go with us. Give us a sweet night. As we lay on our beds, we ask that you will reveal yourself unto us. May our sleep be sweet. And may you give us revelations and dreams with understanding. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, amen. God bless you for coming. Please tell your neighbor, God bless you for coming and see you next week. Audience online, God bless you for being online. See you next week. Bye-bye.